spotlight. So for those of you who are interested in technical careers, it's a chance for us to see what is it to be a software engineer? Or what does it take? What do I need to do to become a product manager? And we have awesome companies like Honest Bee, Carousel being represented here. I'd love to invite Amber on the stage, and she'll be leading our first session with product managers. So please welcome them. Uh, hello, everyone. So this, this is a career spell slide, which means that we'll give an overview for each of you that or what the product manager is looked like. And also, there are some common questions you may have. So we have Meredith from SC Powers. And also, Hi. yeah. <laughs> also, we have uh, Hui Yi from Hello. Carousel. Hi. Uh, so the first question, I think that maybe just you can introduce yourself, like uh, what you are doing now and what's your role in the company? Sure. And I think a lot of people will be kind of curious why would SP, so SP stands for Singapore Power, if you don't know. You know, we're the ones that provide the lights and the water and the gas to you. So we're kind of curious of why would they be hiring digital product managers. Um, the company is going through uh, a phase of digital transformation right now. Um, so my role is to help set up the product practice um, on the business side and to figure out how we can engage with our customers a little bit better with our brand. How are you? Mm, so currently I'm a product manager at Carousel. So the team that I'm working with, uh, we help new users uh, who just joined Carousel become first time successful sellers because uh, eventually the goal of Carousel, which is a mobile marketplace, is to help everyone to start selling the things that they have at home left unused. So basically that's currently what I do. Because I know uh, your YouTube's background, neither of you are from IT background. So can I know that why you choose product manager in this role? Because a lot of people think that actually product manager is actually should be from IT background. So yeah, um, I uh, well I'm a graduate of sociology and geography. I actually wanted to be a teacher badly, and then. Somehow, I stumbled into uh, the corporate world and found myself managing projects and pilot rollouts for a payment company called American Express. Um, and, um, but I realized that not being able to code, or, or at least I appreciate code, helps me give a different um, light to product management. Um, and I think product managers all are generalists. That you have to be good. Um, to manage you know, your stakeholders, the business, you need to know how to bring a product uh, to market, you need to know how to manage the product development cycle. Um, so you not necessarily need to code, um, but just the process of bringing the product from inception to production and going to market is an important part of the whole product manager's role. Yeah. Um, so for myself, I graduated from NUS Business School. And uh, I don't think getting to being a product manager is kind of like a linear journey. So I've been with Carousel for about three plus years and I started out doing customer support. So when I started doing customer support, um, you know, people write in to complain and things. So I kind of understood uh, the user's pain points. And through that, uh, I also worked with the Carousel team then, which was quite small, about less than 10 people. And seeing them work really hard on solving problems for our users really made me really inspired. And then after that, I went to Silicon Valley for a year to kind of do a bit of like user research and also marketing internship there. And it was then I really got like um, kind of into product and technology. And I really saw what other companies were doing there with, with technology to solve problems. And just coming back, uh, I just started to uh, put myself in a product role here at Carousel. So I don't think you necessarily have to be technical. It's a bonus, but um, just being technically curious. So for example, like um, if your team is um, saying that they need uh, like one week to do this thing, uh, you don't necessarily have to know how they are going to do it. But as long as you ask questions, uh, why, can we, why are we doing it like this? Um, can we consider other alternatives? Just being curious about how it works would really help yourself become a better product manager. Yeah, and I'll actually add on to that. The part on solving problems, you need to have a passion to 
find the solution and to be really curious of how to solve a problem. So uh, being customer focused would be a major part of being a product manager as well. I found that there are many different paths for you to. So the first one is that uh, Meredith is go to the company as a product related role, while uh, Hui is different. It's coming from like community manager. So what's the difference between these two paths? Do you think which one is better? I, all, I can't say that all roads lead to product managers because I'm sure the engineers in the room are also part of the solution. But we're all kind of solving the same thing. For me, um, project management and delivery, it's also part of solving a, a, the problem, right? Um, and I imagine customer support as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a better role, but personally, I do prefer product management because you get to... Um, kind of play a part in making that decision to help roll out solutions that help solve users' problems. So that's the part where I feel it's actually more exciting to be in. Yeah. So there's no one prescribed path. It's where we found our passions and then it ended up with product. So in this case, actually, you may encourage people to um, look for the pr product role directly instead of maybe roll me into the other role, like to know the products first. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of um, students in the room, so um, you know, usually you won't know what your calling is, or you don't know what path is the right path, and you would have to test and learn and. And actually, that is a big part of product as well. You try something, you find what you like about it, you learn from it, and you evolve in the next role. So it's going to be an ongoing journey. And then, I mean, for me personally, it was doing um, quite a long time of product management. I did my own business for a little while, and then I went into marketing. And then I came back to product because I realized that that is what I wanted to do. And that is after quite a few years as well. So yeah, there is no prescribed, I think, no prescribed path. You try, you see what you like about it, you tweak, and then you move on, try again, and then you decide. You don't have to decide right now. Yeah, I believe a lot of people out there, they want to be a product manager. So can you just um, summarize like three main words or three trees that you think you want to recruit a product manager you want them to have, the traits, the characteristics? Maybe not three words, but uh, firstly, you must have a passion to solve user problems. Um, that's very important to help champion the user's needs because ultimately they are the ones using your product. So you really have to go out there and understand them well. Yeah. I mean, other things like managing stakeholder expectations is also a challenge, but um, if you're up for it, it's actually quite fun. So mm. So does it three plus three, six? No, <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, it would be maybe a mindset that would be analytical and data-centric. So a lot of decisions that we make as a product manager has to be data-informed. Whether is it data coming from a user study or whether is it data coming from an analytics or results that you've seen. So having that mindset is really important because, I mean, we would prioritize features throughout gut but it, it, it is always supported with data. So I think that's one. And I think what is really hard to find is um, kind of the persistence to want to get something completed and done because a product journey can be very long. In fact, when you launch a product, that's not the end of the journey. That's actually just the beginning. You have to grow it, you have to engage, and you have to see how you want to um, kind of fine tune it and pivot it. So maybe persistence is one of them, to get things done. Um, and then communication skills. I think the soft skills for product manager is actually really important because you have to work with a big group or you know, a small group of um, engineers and you have to work with them on a daily basis. And then you have to work with stakeholders and they all come with very different temperament, um, business thoughts. So having a skill set for good communication and managing stakeholders, yeah, that would be a key as well. I think it's really good opinion, yeah. So in this case, actually, uh, we will open the question to the ground because the time is really tight. So we only have maybe two questions. So any of you want to raise questions, you can approach the mic. Do we have a mic? Okay, yeah. Uh, 
maybe only two questions. So, any of you have questions for them? If you want to pursue maybe PM or you are curious about this role. Yeah. I have a question, actually. Um, thank you for sharing about product management. I know in some companies, um, it, they work really closely with engineers. Have you ever had that in your experience? Did you ever feel that maybe having a technical fluency might have helped you communicate with a developer team better, or, or any of that by any chance in your experiences? So, like just now I mentioned, um, technical knowledge does help but it's not really necessary. But I have to say, when I first started out in the beginning, it was a bit challenging not to understand uh, certain technical limitations. But over time, you really get better by asking questions. And I think I was very fortunate to have my team, the team of engineers that I work with. They really helped me to understand what they were doing. So I would ask questions like, um, why are we using React? Why are we using this, that? And they would really explain to me why. So that really helped me. So it's not that you, um, it's not that it won't be an advantage, but then this is something that you would get better over time with. Yeah, I think the technical, I like the way you put it, technical fluency comes with the experience. I, having that knowledge would just help us maybe get a better estimate or understand why something's implemented one way or the other. Um, but, um, and since we have to work with the engineers on a um, very close basis, I think that, us, that helps us appreciate their work as well, because you know, there is actually a lot of complexities implementing code. Um, but it's not necessary. Um, and for us, uh, at least for myself, it was more of uh, managing the stakeholders that was a lot of the job. Uh, any more questions? No, we really run out of time. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. That uh, from the, the coding community, how do you see the challenge or how you see the transformation in the last few years that is it easy to find the talent did uh, people locally or is there a shortage? Because globally, it is a war of talent uh, today. For product or for coding? From coding perspective, from the technical perspective. Because yeah. you are doing digitization, so you are looking for technical people, but uh, do you find it challenging to find the quality people locally? I think in the last few years, it was really interesting. There has been a boom of talent, and the schools have been kind of funneling into that as well. So from an internship standpoint, we see a lot of applicants. Um, and, um, and then when we expand a view of hiring coders, we don't just hire from Singapore, we hire from the region as well. And there's tons of talent around the region um, for the last two years. But on the product side, that's a whole different thing. And it's very interesting to see that the product talent is still quite little, I would say. Um, and I think the product manager pool of people, we keep seeing the same people shuffling around different companies. Um, one hypothesis I had was because a lot of product management um, functions are all centralized in Silicon Valley and very little uh, real product management is um, that starts from Asia so you know we hope to grow and I hope to grow the product management skill set uh, in our companies and wherever we go to yeah maybe we need to start another group that's for product managers <laughs> How about Hui? because I know Carousel is a startup a very successful startup so maybe different from ST powers Mm, Your opinion is different from SP Powers? Um, generally, it's the same. So we are also hiring uh, engineers and also product managers. It's been challenging to find talent. Um, so basically, I think what other alternatives we could have is that you can find people interested in product management within the team and also groom them to become successful product managers. So it's also one of the ways to get talent. So, uh, sorry, we're really out of time. So if you have questions, you can ask them um, after, I mean, down stage. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is a very quick panel. Thank you.
so next one we will have our uh, data science panel. So we have uh, Annalie from Ministry of Defense of Singapore, uh, and also Shreya from Uber, and Arushi from Uber. It's like a kind of Uber panel. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this case, would you just brief introduce um, yourself, like what are you doing now? Yeah. Hi, my name is Anna Lin. I work with MINDEF, or Ministry of Defense. So um, I'm a data scientist in the psychology department, so it means I work with a lot of HR data. The questions I, I answer include like, what makes a good soldier? Um, what are the risks of suicide? And what are the traits of a good, say, commando? Um, I also deal with questions of retention. So um, what makes a person want to stay in the organization? Are there signs if a person wants to leave? Um, other questions I deal with are also like um, our foreign relations. So, for example, you could analyze data such as weapons trade, and then you can see the, the health of uh, the relationship between uh, bilateral, uh, bilateral relationships from weapons trade data. Um, besides that, I also had a stint with Disney Research, um, and there I also analyze uh, the profiles of movie fans based on their personalities. So I think one, one good thing about being a data scientist is that you can apply the same skills on different types of data, right? And I think that keeps the job exciting because you're always working on new problems. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shreya. Uh, so I'm from NTU, from a computer engineering background. Uh, after graduation, I worked in consulting for two years, and I've been at Uber for the last year and a half. Um, and at Uber, I worked on a lot of different sort of functional domains. So as Annalyn mentioned, if you're an analyst, you actually get a chance to work with different kind of functions like marketing, fraud. Uh, so most recently, I've been working with Uber Eats, so looking at restaurant analytics. So which restaurants are doing well on the platform? How do we retain the ones that are doing well? How do we action on the ones that are potentially like low quality and things like that? Um, hi, all. So I'm Arushi. I'm also an analyst at Uber. Uh, very similar to Shreya, I studied here at NTU um, electrical and electronics engineer and very shortly into my course I discovered that I was not really inclined to an engineering career path as such. Um, I worked as a consultant in IBM for a couple of years where I didn't really do analytics as such but I knew that I really liked data so I started including analytics just by myself into all my projects whether it was like project management or process improvement or like research, I just started like building up my skills myself. And then there was a timely opening at Uber. Um, and I have also been at Uber for about a year and a half, uh, being solving problems around the business. But more specifically, I do um, safety and fraud analytics, which basically means solving problems such as how do we reduce accidents? How do we remove uh, bad drivers or bad riders from the platform? Um, as well as like how do we make our riders feel more safe and yeah, all sorts of questions to make sure that everybody using the platform feels safe and comfortable. I know that actually data analytics job is very interesting because I was data analyst as well. So I know that um, by analyzing the data, you can find something that other people take for granted, but which is maybe not the right idea and not the right op opinion. Could you just share, us, uh, share with us one interesting finding that people think is true, but it's not? I mean, through analyzing your data or any interesting project you think you are doing now? Is there any finding? I'm just thinking what I can share. But I think um, you brought up a very interesting point is that people always have preconceptions about uh, certain, their own hypothesis on what is true. And very often, sometimes the data brings up something that is unexpected. Uh, so our job as data scientists is actually to give the hard evidence to those uh, assumptions that people make. And actually, um, uh, there are actually quite a lot of times that uh, people's assumptions are right. And uh, we just give the supporting evidence that, yeah, you're right, just go ahead with this policy. Uh, other times, uh, when, people, when we have to prove people wrong, um, that's where the uphill battle starts. It's like, uh, where do you get your data from? Are you sure your techniques are right? And all that. So um, 
I think it's a lot about uh, communication and visualization as well. So um, you realize that as a data scientist, it's not about only crunching numbers. It's also about communicating your conclusions to uh, the, your audiences. So especially for policymakers, when you're trying, when the future of um, uh, 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 guys or you have brothers or fathers, you uh, you know that um, all the men in Singapore go through national service, and our policy really affects more than half the country. So um, whatever policy we roll out, we want to make sure that it's right. Um, but sometimes, especially when you're working in a male-dominated uh, environment, some of uh, the men may have egos. They say, uh, this is something I've believed in for 10 years, and here's this young girl telling me that, oh, no, my data shows that you're wrong. Um, so how do you communicate uh, that conclusion in a respectful, um, yet uh, in, a for, in, a, in an assertive way, yet respectful, that helps them save face, um, give them a back door to come down, say, so, okay, actually, uh, you may see this way, I understand, but then... Uh, you know, these are repercussions if you go along, if you follow all your own hypotheses, these are the repercussions they have to face later on. Um, so it's, it's our job to make sure that uh, we let them see two sides of the story. Um, yeah, so I can't come up with a specific example as well. But like, so what we do at Uber mostly is uh, when we roll something out, if it's a campaign or if it's a product feature, the analysts will always ensure that like, there's an experiment that runs behind it and there's data that proves that what we're doing actually makes sense for the users. So that's where we come in as the gatekeepers and like, we keep the business lines honest in terms of ensuring that data is being tracked and data is correct uh, when things are being reported. Um, I think, uh, well, similar to what they said, but one thing that we also do at Uber is that um, since we're a global company, a lot of our things that work in one region may not work in another region. Like, you'll see some problems um, specific to, say, the US or India, but you try the same uh, kind of product feature in, say, this region, and it won't work out that well. So I think a lot of the work we do is, like, testing those things on our region and seeing like, what, does this make sense or does this not, rather than like all the engineers put in their efforts and they roll it out here and it's not really a useful um, feature. So I'm, I'm not really allowed to say a lot about, <laughs> I can't really disclose a lot about it, but I think it's like very specific to context and it's not like a open, like it's not like a one size fits all hypothesis. I think that um, our audience had to be data analysts to figure out themselves. So actually, data is so hot nowadays, and especially for our workshops in the afternoon, the data already sold out. So in this case, I, I think the audience may want to know what skills is required to be data scientist, because I know, I know all of you come from different backgrounds, but not CS background. So people think that CS is so hot in data, well, statistics may it's also hot, but they also want to know what's a real skill set the industries need and how can they become data analyst? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you're right. I'm actually a psychology major. <laughs> I majored in psychology econs and I stumbled upon stats by accident because I needed to do my thesis. They don't know how to analyze my data. So I took uh, a stats course and I found that uh, it was really interesting. And I was quite fortunate to have a very good machine learning lecturer, which got me interested in the whole field. Um, so, I would say actually the most important skill is curiosity to, when you see something that's interesting, say, hey, you could cluster movie fans, that's interesting, how do I do that? Um, so you can start going online, nowadays everything's on Stack Overflow, you just Google, and then people have codes written up for you already, and they even provide the, the sample data set for you to try. So as long as you have curiosity, I don't think there are, uh, yeah, it's very easy for you to access this field. And, um, as you mentioned, like that you organize workshops and they're really popular. So there's, there are just so many resources for you nowadays. And um, I'm also part of this group called Data Science SG um, that invites data scientists to share their work. So if you're wondering about what kind of challenges you may face as a data scientist on the job, um, these people will share like real time their experiences. Or oh, these are the problems I face while coding. These are the problems that I face while trying to communicate my findings, etc. So um, in short, be curious, uh, go online and just Google, and go for more meetups. Um, so the thing with analytics is that um, it's a really broad spectrum. So analytics can be as simple as descriptive, so where you're just telling people what the data tells you, and then it goes on to being more predictive, like where you tell, give 
specific recommendations based on the data. So there are different technical skills that you need across the spectrum. But if you're starting out, essentially you don't actually need a lot of technical skills. Like Annalyn mentioned, it's more about curiosity and asking the right kind of questions from the data. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, there's no, I don't think there's like one or two golden paths leading it up to being a good data analyst. I think like it's a very generic skill set and just what you broadly need is like being comfortable with data, knowing how to break down a big ambiguous problem into small digestible problems, um, having a genuine love and understanding of data and numbers. Um, and yeah, we live in an age where everything is very available online in terms of like courses and books and articles that you can all learn from. And if you're super, super passionate, there's a lot of publicly available data that you can just like use and experiment and um, start sol solving problems with that already. So do you, is there any hard skills that you want to recommend? Because so many languages are Python. And also one of my friends, she's uh, he's still in school. They have two set of courses. One is for neural network, and the other one is for, for big data. So she can only choose one. So she's wondering which one she really choose, she needs to choose. So any hard skills recommendation or where to start? Maybe start from Excel, start from R, or start from Python? Yeah, I think starting from Excel and R is pretty good because uh, those are easier to learn and there's plenty of resources available to um, teach you that. And um, yeah, I myself have never used like neural networks <laughs> a lot yet, so I can't comment on that. But I, I believe R and Excel are a good starting point. Yeah. Um, just one thing to add on as well, like SQL is obviously like the basic data extraction scripting language. So I think that's a must have skill as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. And um, maybe just to add on one more point, you should try to focus on the problem you're trying to solve rather than the technique you are using. Because once you have an interesting problem, you'll be very motivated to find whatever technique you need to solve the problem. So, and different problems require different techniques. Sometimes Python is better, sometimes R is better. Sometimes you need neural networks, sometimes Excel will do. So, um, my advice is just find a problem that you're interested in and Google. <laughs> yes. Uh, for people who are not from IT background uh, or not from uh, IT related major, uh, jobs, I have to tell you that um, the only way, I mean, the first way that IT people to solve problems is to Google. So Google is our best friend. <laughs> yeah. So we will open the question to the ground. I think uh, there will be a lot of questions from you. So can I now we, anyone who have questions, you can raise up your hand so we can pass the mic to you. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because I work in this industry, but I am going to do a completely shameless plug for something that's free. For, and almost everyone in this room qualifies for entry because of your genetic makeup. Um, I and uh, another company in Singapore, we periodically run uh, day long workshops called Data Girls. So if you, and they are specifically designed at people sort of not the people on the panel, because you know what you're talking about. They're specifically designed for people who have, uh, women who have curiosity about, well, this analytics stuff seems really hot, um, how, but I don't know anything about it. So if you look up the website datadriven.sg, and you will periodically see, uh, we run day-long workshops, we just run two, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and you, we start from the assumption that you know nothing, so we explain what data is, we explain what SQL is, we explain, and then at the end of it, you're actually analysing data and making a mini presentation to a pretend management group. So um, if you're interested, have a look, and they're completely free. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. There's so the, many hands. The girl there, the girl there. <laughs> Hi, thanks. thank you so much for um, sharing with all your experiences here. So for someone who's interested in an entry-level position at data science, what would you recommend? Should she j just start applying for jobs? Because you said something about like s having soft skills, but most of the jobs that are online requires technical skills. So maybe just a couple like suggestions and where she could start. Uh, 
Where should you start? Uh, <laughs> no, not Google, but rather a lot of times when I went for interviews, uh, I've been asked for my portfolio. So projects I've done. Uh, if you are looking at entry level, most likely you wouldn't have any work experience. But if, let's say I'm the hiring manager and I want to search for someone who's curious, because in this field, everything moves so fast. You know, you may be a perfect expert today, but if you slack for one year, and then you'll be behind already. So to me, curiosity is very important. And to find that, I could look at your portfolio and see, hey, did this person do anything outside of school? Uh, any other projects? Uh, do you have a GitHub account? So GitHub is like where you keep your code uh, and what kind of problems you try to solve in your own free time. So uh, if, if you are uh, in, in school right now, this is something you can do in your free time. Say, okay, let's try solving this problem. Uh, write a simple code and maybe post it on your blog and, and do some reflections. What kind of challenges you faced and how do you resolve them? So from blogs and your GitHub account, uh, hiring managers can tell a lot about um, what kind of person you are and um, how you persevered through these challenges, how you solve them. Yeah, and also it depends on your background as well. So if you come from a more technical background, even if you don't have the specific requirements, if you can demonstrate basic programming ability, even in other languages, and if you can demonstrate critical thinking ability, then maybe the hiring manager can overlook specific technical requirements. Yeah, I think we mentioned a lot of, like, since we mentioned soft skills in general, uh, like problem solving and being comfortable with numbers and data, uh, when you're applying for a job, it makes sense, like, in your resume to kind of uh, highlight how you've done that in your previous experiences or, like, any projects you've done at school or any extracurriculars that you've done at school. And as for the technical part, um, I wasn't technical when I joined, but um, I, I found this website called Data Camp. Um, it's really very useful, and it has a ton of uh, courses that you can do interactively, learn R and Python and um, all sorts of statistical modeling techniques. So you can definitely do that in your free time to buff up your technical skills. I think they can also join the cargo competition, right? Yeah, can also write on your profile. Also, uh, there are a lot of hackathons, also data girls. So next week, we'll have an US MIT hackathon hold in US. You can always join that. Yeah. Any last questions? Sorry, we run out of time. Uh, yeah, you raise hands first, sorry. Data to make sure that you to make sure that you're very objective when you pull data and not pulling data to back up something you already suspect is true. So the question is, how do you pull uh, objective data and uh, not end up with a subjective set of data that confirms your existing assumptions, right? Okay, how do I make sure that I pull data that's not just backing up my own claims? Um, uh, that's a good question. So if your data, I mean, there are, there are two things you need uh, for analysis, right? The data and the technique. If your data is lousy, no matter how good your technique is, you know, your, conclusions, your conclusions may not be reliable. Um, is there a specific context uh, you are thinking about when you ask this question? Okay, okay, okay. So um, basically, behavioral issues. Yeah. Okay. So uh, okay. For this one, I can say um, in Mindef we do a lot of surveys, and this is a prime example of how the way you ask certain, certain questions can elicit certain responses from your participants. So you can, if um, things like uh, pick two vocations you like versus pick at least two. Or yeah. So subtle phrasings uh, will affect responses and. It is actually a whole new area of work that we go into to try to refine our phrases um, to make sure that we get the objective uh, responses that we need. Um, so at Uber, when we are analyzing something, typically we are not the party who did the activity. So if, for example, if you're analyzing a campaign, we are not the ones who executed the campaign. So we don't really have um, a bias or like uh, a motive to sort of 
uh, tweak the data in such a way where, where it looks good. So having an independent analytics function is very important in that sense, where it becomes a gatekeeper to different functions in the company. So that's one. And I think the second thing is what we usually do also is if you are reporting something, for example, if x goes up, y goes up as well, what we'll usually do is really indicate what is the data, like what is the x and the y. Like, what is the underlying data set? Did we exclude some people? Did we exclude certain time frames? Why did we exclude these people? Why did we exclude these time frames? That's very important as well. Because if you make certain exclusions, like you said, it can sort of tweak the message. And it's very important to indicate if you have tweaked it in certain ways. I think in addition to that, it's also useful to like benchmark. For example, if we're like running a campaign and we're seeing like did it have a good impact on the business? Uh, it's also useful to benchmark it to other campaigns and see like did it do better? Like was the uplift even more than another campaign? Is it more than a normal day? Like benchmark, don't see just the number by itself, but compare it to a baseline. Uh, so that also helps as well. So I guess it's about replication, benchmarking. It's the same like any ac academic study, right? No one study is perfect, but if you find the same result, multiple times, then it's probably right. And no set of data is perfectly objective. There will always be limitations. So it's just about identifying what the flaws are and then try to replicate uh, it with maybe a different data set the next time. I think overall it's just being thorough and like making sure there's no like confounding variable that could have like affected it in a different way and like testing it for statistical significance. So just making sure that your result is as objective as possible. Sorry, this is the last question we can ask. <laughs> so uh, you, you can communicate with them on, on stage as well. Thank you so much for. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So our last career spotlight will be SE Group, Software Engineer and Developer Group. Uh, so we have three girls here. Ukasha is from Microsoft. And Kita is from uh, Hanisby, and also Mutu is from Thoughtworks. So it's just uh, the same. The same <laughs> first question. <laughs> what do you do? Could you just briefly introduce? Hey everyone! Um, it's a Saturday afternoon, and I know we're holding you back from lunch. But uh, before I tell you what I do, uh, I just want to ask: How many of you have actually gone on a website and you know, say, click that small button out there which says chat? with us or you know okay and how many of you think that's really a human chatting with you well I'll just let out a secret to you it's in most cases I'm not saying all but in most cases it's actually a bot that's replying to you you say hi and it says hey how may I help you and then you start the dialogue with you it's mostly a bot these days and that's the part of artificial intelligence so why I'm saying that is because I do a thing like that. I build bots and then I come here and talk to you people about it. So that's my role as a tech evangelist where I go out and evangelize Microsoft's technology to audiences. Hi everyone. Um, I um, don't have very specific projects to share but I work as a software engineer at Honestbee and that basically involves working on the problems that the business faces from time to time. So some of the things that I've worked on would be like payment solution, making sure that our payments go out uh, correctly to the customers, managing refunds, etc. Uh, and then also a lot of things related to, um, we are fundamentally a logistics company that's doing on-demand logistics in various spaces, uh, agnostic of the verticals. It could be groceries, food, etc. And so um, a lot of the play that we have is in the logistics space. And because um, everything, if, you know, when we start iterating with the process, some of the things are manual, but slowly we find ways to automate it and use technology to make things a lot more optimized. And that's where my role comes in. And so depending on, um, you know, what's going on, I mean, I, I get certain projects that, I, uh, that would typically support the logistics business that we have. Hi, I'm Muthu. I work for ThoughtWorks. Um, so in ThoughtWorks, we help our clients solve their business problems by leveraging our tech skills. Uh, in my current project, I do something similar to Utkarsha. So we're developing a business intelligence application for our clients. So what it is like is um, you can ask it a question like, um, say you're an insurance agent, you want to know in which month you can roll out new policies 
uh, when are the clients most likely to pick up those. So there are two parts to it. One is uh, the natural language processing, identifying the intent of the question the user is asking. And once you've identified the intent, going to the data, and uh, there's some data analytics involved as well to answer, uh, to give the user the right answer to the question. Uh, so that's what I'm doing right now. I know that all of you actually from IT background, <laughs> so which is very different from previous two groups. So, but a lot of people after they graduate, they still want to switch to, you know, the software engineer or developer. Uh, in your, have you met any people like that before, in your career? Because they can, this can be a good model. I, I do. I did met some before, but I'm not sure about you. Actually, I didn't have a computer science degree when I joined ThoughtWorks. Um, I think all you need is interest uh, and curiosity, like the previous panels mentioned. Um, if you have interest, you can learn anything. And um, I recently read a HBR article about uh, how diverse teams are more smarter. So, I mean, if you all learn the same thing or go through the same curriculum, then we approach the problem in the same way, which means we would not identify certain pitfalls in our solution, or maybe we may not be that creative or innovative in what we come up with, because we are all trying to think in the same way. But we come from a diverse background, then we get, we all approach the problems in different ways. So as a group, we will come up with a much better solution than as individuals. So I think, um, People from all background should take up uh, software development as a career. Um, to add on to Mutu's point, I have met people um, who have come from non-technical backgrounds. And typically, what differentiates, I mean, eventually, you have to come in with a mentality that it's just a computer that's built by humans. And so it really cannot be smarter than you or could even be doing things that are not you know, that don't follow logic in a way, right? So when you see certain weird messages, you know, removing that intimidation from your minds and just just trying to logically break down a problem helps. But actually what I'd like to uh, mention is that sometimes when I graduated as a computer science uh, uh, graduate, one of the things that I felt was that I needed to explore more problems that uh, around me before I apply technical skills to it. So I took a slightly, um, uh, a slightly non-conventional route where I actually went into consulting to, to look at a consulting field which was not technical consulting but it was purely social innovation and business strategy consulting because um, I felt like uh, some of the problems that interested me most were social innovation related and uh, I knew that technology has a lot of, it can actually be applied in very, very useful ways um, in these problems. but. To understand these problems and to really empathize with them, I had to go to that route. And then when I joined Honest B, I found myself uh, just a lot more aware, a lot more um, uh, curious in terms of asking questions or sometimes even asking my project managers or product managers, why are we implementing this feature or like how does this help our customers? And I feel like that helps me become a better engineer as well because um, I rarely find occasions where I haven't done enough research on a particular feature that I'm working that eventually, you know, after two, three weeks of working on it, we realize that we should have never built that feature, you know? So, and that happens and that can be frustrating for many engineers and I, I'm not, I, I feel like that background of coming from a, of taking a slight switch and a detour also helps open your eyes. So if you are from a technical background, uh, you know, just be curious about other things around you and then that could surely benefit you even um, in your engineering careers. Uh, true, I mean with all the motivation and the skills that you need, how exactly do you go about switching into a career in say software engineering? Um, there are a lot of ways you can do that. One, yes, you will have to, uh, you know, get hang of some programming languages, but the idea is just understand what the motivation is, as uh, Ankita was also saying, understand where your code fits in the bigger picture, and then ramping up on programming languages is not really very difficult, you know. You have a lot of these courses available online, so that's one. And a lot of big tech companies uh, actually host events, uh, coding challenges where you can go about uh, you know showing showcasing your product or showcasing your uh, code and if at all you'd stand a chance there because there are a lot of techies who come there a lot of these companies who come there and you can actually go about networking with them and f exploring possibilities to uh, start up a career in software engineering so i don't think uh, not having a formal education 
in software engineering should be a barrier. It's about the opportunities you want to explore, and trust me, they are limitless. Uh, but even so, I think majority of people still think it's hard because when when people from um, non-IT backgrounds, uh, non-IT related backgrounds, the company will always ask, um, "Why do I have to recruit you? Because you're from non-IT background." So in this case, how can they show to the company that they're actually capable to do the job? Uh, I think. It's mostly about uh, the perception in the first place where you think that it's difficult. I think uh, programming and software engineering is as easy or as difficult as any other job. It's about the intent to learn. And trust me, uh, there's a huge online community which is always there to help you out. You just post a simple question and you do get replies. So first thing, learning is not a challenge. Second, when you were asked why, to, why you should be recruited, uh, yes, it's always a good idea to have something as a proof of what you're capable of. So, um, you know, the GitHub story that you were talking about. You build your code, you put it up there, show the impact that it can have, because it's always important to tie back uh, the business value or the impact that your code can have. And if, you, if at all you can demonstrate that very well, I think that shouldn't really be a problem. Um, yeah, I completely agree with uh, Utkarsha that a large part of it, bill, uh, a large part of it is actually perception uh, because uh, it isn't it isn't difficult, but just looking at some of those uh, terminal windows uh, that some of you have looked at, and uh, you know, looking at that feed in and then code in green and red color makes you think like, whoa, these guys are just you know, I don't know what they're doing. But actually, when you get into it, it's um, I'm sure Amber has also seen this in the you know in the boot camps uh, that actually it's not really that hard. So one is g getting rid of the perception, but to add to it. Um, Initiative really counts. So when, when you're asked why should we hire you, talk about your projects, even if they're not technical, and then you know, show how you have tried to apply. Like maybe, a, maybe it's a non-technical project, and then you've applied a really small, um, you know, small piece in that which was actually technical. Like maybe you built a form to co collect survey results, right? And you build the form yourself. And building a form is actually a really simple exercise. So some of these things can uh, show that you are a fast learner and you're curious. Uh, so those things would typically convince a lot of uh, employers. And then I guess one of the challenges that happens is when you actually get that job and you're in the company and you've come from a non-technical background, you see engineers who have experience. Um, and this is where um, basically sometimes it could mean putting in that extra effort and those extra hours, but there are always people uh, who like to mentor. Like if you ask anybody who who has been working in the field and you ask them for their help, they would rarely tell you that they just cannot help. So showing certain initiative, interest in their work, asking them questions, and maybe trying to help them out uh, with some of the small pieces that they're doing, that can also significantly boost your uh, you know, confidence as soon as you join a new company. And then from there on, I think there's no looking back. I agree with what both, both of them said. So uh, two points, right? Programming is hard. And uh, recruiters look for computer science degrees when they recruit people uh, for software engineering role. I think both of them are just myths. Programming is not at all hard, and recruiters don't look at your degree. Like, uh, they always uh, see what you're capable of, whether you have a computer science degree or whether you don't. So you're all considered equals, irrespective of what degree you have. Or even if you don't have a degree, we have uh, people, really senior people at ThoughtWorks who never went to university. So, um, and as for me, uh, how did I cope with a software engineering job without a computer science background? I think when ThoughtWorks hired me, what they looked for was potential and interest. Uh, and I had an awesome team. My first team was just awesome. They were all mentors to me. I learned everything from them. So one was, yes, you have to be open to learning. And there is that few extra hours that you might have to put in initially so that you have a, a bigger learning curve than people who come with a computer science background because they always start uh, somewhere. Uh, you have to reach that gap and then reach there, and then it's all the same. So, and I think in Singapore, which with all of these communities like tech ladies and coding girls and all of this, I think you have that support system. And like online, you have numerous courses, free courses like Coursera courses, all of them are good. So I think if you have interest, self uh, teaching yourself, um, or even uh, 
looking for mentors shouldn't be hard. Yes, very good points. If you want to learn coding, just come to Coding Girls and also Tech Ladies, maybe. Yeah, so in this case, we'll open the question to the ground. Do you have any questions for them? Um, thank you for sharing your um, opinions and views on um, being an engineer. I just have got a question because now UI and UX are booming. So just, uh, just want to know your perspective on what's the difference between a UX designer and being a software engineer? Because uh, you guys are pretty much related. A uh, UX designer is one who designs the user journey, like they empathize with the user, they do user interviews, they f find out what the users really want. Um, and they suggest these are the features that we could do to product owners and, be, and between UX designers and product owners uh, they have a vision for how the product should look like. Uh, developers are the one uh, who actually make that, make that product or implement that idea. So uh, the developers have still, still have to be convinced of that idea, still have to believe in that product that the product owner and the UX designer has come up with. Uh, but the responsibility of coming up with what, how the product should look like is uh, more with the UX designer. Having said that, that's completely true. Uh, UX designers have a vision for the product in mind, but uh, in my experience at Honest Bee, uh, our, one of our UX designers is a computer science graduate and he's highly, he's, uh, he chose not to go into programming, but he's very, very good at CSS, for example, uh, and just, you know, uh, more of the visual elements. And the way that helps when programmers and uh, UX designers work together is that you can actually discuss what's feasible and what's not. Because oftentimes, the vision that you have for your website and certain, you know, you may want to have a drop down here and you may want to have a slider here. Sometimes, technically, those things can be um, maybe hard to implement and maybe, maybe you can uh, run into things like SEO challenges because of your design. Uh, you had a certain vision, but it makes your website very difficult for search engine optimization. And that's where, you know, when, when UX designers and engineers work together or if a UX designer has a technical background already, not saying that that's a requirement or that's a, a barrier to being a UX designer. Uh, that's when you can actually come up with a, with a vision which is also um, it makes sense from an engineering point of view as well. Uh, and it, in general, is a much, much better design because it's uh, come out of collaboration between the two. Um, I think they've pretty much covered it all. So uh, in a short line, uh, I think the UX designer comes up with the idea and the programmer just adds life to the idea. That's pretty much about it. One last question. We only have one minute left. <laughs> No questions? Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, hello. Um, as I know, there's like a lot of um, programming language like Java, Python, Ruby, all those. So usually, because we all know it evolves very fast in this industry, so do, do you guys, or as a software engineer, do you prefer to like go in depth, like deep in one or two verticals, or do you prefer to, you know, go in a varieties of programming language or technical skills, yeah. or which one is better? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I think technology moves fast, and it's very important to keep yourself upskilled. So uh, say Java and C++ and things like that, they've got a pretty uh, similar underlying architecture and a similar underlying structure. So it's not very difficult to really ramp up on the language. As for me, I particularly like Java a lot. <laughs> So I advocate for Java, but it's not really necessary to know one or, or like a lot of languages. Even if you're well versed with say two of them, it's very easy to switch to others. Yeah, um, one of the things that I personally believe in is a software engineer is a software engineer and not a Java engineer or a Ruby engineer, for example, because uh, many of the skills are very transferable. The way you learn a language is very, very, um, 
similar, uh, you know, you learn the syntax, you, and you pretty much Google, like, you know, you, you learn Ruby and you're like, oh, I know how to do this in Java. I know, uh, I know how functions work in Java. How does it work in Ruby? And then, you know, you find an equivalent, like, it's literally like learning Chinese and English and then, you know, translating something in Chinese to English and saying it out, right? And that's how programming languages are as well. Um, I personally enjoy, just as a, you know, Everyone likes learning and, you know, sometimes you just want to challenge yourself with those extra uh, things on the side. And that's where I like looking at new languages and what is out there and, you know, building some side projects in a new language. So that's just for my own personal interest and sometimes it comes in use as well um, professionally. But I think it's just out of your own interest. But pick up any language, whatever it is, and start small. Uh, that's what I would advise. Uh, I agree with Ankita. Uh, you're a software engineer. You're not a Java engineer or a Ruby engineer. Um, ultimately, the fundamentals are the same. All the languages are the same. Uh, like They will have different principles based on whether you go for an object-oriented language or a functional programming language. But if you know one each, it, it should be very easy to switch. Um, and um, same as her, Like I like exploring new languages. Uh, I'm polyglot, and it works. Uh, I mean, I'm, it keeps me motivated as well when I explore a new language. It's relatively unknown, so that keeps me excited for a while, but it also helps in my job that I get to apply whatever I've learned. So it, it works both ways. And yeah, once you know uh, one language well, it, it is uh, really simple to learn new languages. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you.